The word belief is something that you have a conviction about. Something that is yours. It shouldn't be something that is someone else's. Right. You shouldn't believe in something just because I do. Right. I shouldn't believe in something just because you do. Yeah. Now, we all know that we should believe what the Bible says. Right. But you also need to have your own conviction yep. of the Word of God. Okay? Yeah. I always tell you, don't just take my word for anything that you hear me say. None of it. As far as you know, uh, I'm, I'm an absolute liar. Okay? If everything I say does not confer with or backed up by what's in this book, then it's not true. Okay? No matter how much of a conviction I have of it, it all has to be based upon what the Bible says. Okay? But you need to have your own <laughs> conviction of the Word of God. Because you will fight harder for your own conviction than someone else's. You will defend your conviction stronger than someone else's. If someone asks you to defend that conviction, and it's not your conviction, only what you've heard. Like I've uh, had some people, I'll get a minute saying, I've had some people throughout the, uh, throughout the years say, well, that's always what my papa was saying. Okay. Well. Do you hold the same conviction? Well, I, I don't know. It's just what I've always been told. Well, you need to find out for yourself. Right. Yeah. Okay? Because it's not your conviction if it's somebody else's. Yeah. All right? So that's something that you need to challenge yourself with. What do I believe? Do I believe in the Word of God? Do I believe uh, in, in, in Jesus Christ? Now, hopefully you do. I believe you do. Looking at the choir. The choir. Uh, <laughs> preach probably the choir here on a, uh, on a Wednesday night, but... Uh, sometimes you need to challenge yourself. All right? Is this just something I've heard for all of my church life, or do I really hold that conviction in my heart? Because, listen to me, we need to be fighting for the truth of Scripture. Yes. That's right. That's right. We need to be defending the truth of Scripture. Amen. And if you don't believe it, you won't do the other one. Okay? Mark chapter number 16. I'm going to do an introduction tonight to a series of messages I'm going to begin uh, bringing on Wednesday nights. I was going to do the uh, the ending lesson on the resurrection, piecing it all together. Uh, it won't go old. I'll keep it till Sunday night. Uh, but I feel led of God that this is the direction I want to go on Wednesday nights for the next few weeks or so. Uh, so I want to do an introduction of it tonight. Uh, on the Great Commission, okay? And we'll do the introduction of the Great Commission tonight, and then for the next so many weeks uh, going forward, uh, we'll look and break it down uh, how the Great Commission was given uh, to the disciples and how that transfers to us, okay? And we'll look at that for the next so many weeks. Uh, and then Sunday night, we'll do the, uh, the ending lesson on the, uh, the, the order of the resurrection. But begin with me, hear me tonight. Uh, this great commission is given in one shape, fashion, or form in all four of the Gospels, including in the beginning of Acts. It is used in all four, including the book of Acts, uh, as one commentator I read this week said, because of the conviction of it. Now, what we do know, I'm going to give a little bit, is that the great commission was given in Galilee. You remember whenever Jesus told his disciples, I'm going to meet you in Galilee? Well, that's where he gave the Great Commission at, okay? On that mountain in Galilee, Mount uh, Arbel. Arbel, if I'm saying that right, I didn't write down. Uh, anyway, it's on the western side of the Sea of Galilee, down below Capernaum. Uh, that's where this mountain is, the highest mountain range in, uh, uh, in Galilee, and it's right on the Sea of Galilee. So on top of that mountain is believed where Jesus made his disciples, and I also read to the broadcast from Christmas the other day, uh, Sunday or so ago, uh, about uh, in the book of First Corinthians, chapter number fifteen, where the Bible Paul said, uh, given the account of the resurrection, he said that Jesus appeared to above five hundred brethren at one time. Uh, most people do believe, Rocky, that this mountain is where Jesus would appear to that above five hundred at one time, because of the announcement of Jesus telling his disciples, and then repeated by the angels to the women, and so on and so on. He's going to meet them in Galilee. So all these people were there. Uh, whether the Great Commission was given to all of them or just the disciples is up for debate. But
Now, a lot of people believe that this is where Jesus met with the 500 at one time. And Paul said many are still alive today. But this is the very mountain where this great commission is given to. And the background uh, would have been beautiful, overlooking the Sea of Galilee, overlooking all those little cities uh, uh, going down through Galilee, pointing down toward Jerusalem. And Jesus begins to make the point of telling his disciples to take what I've given you and share it with all these people uh, that, that, are, that are going forth, okay? So look you with me, uh, Mark 16, verse 15. And he, which is Jesus, said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And the drink of the dead thing it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Look at verse 19. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. But look at verse 20. And they went forth, who's the they? The they that received the Great Commission. And preached every word. That's what he told them to do. The Lord working with them and confirming the word, confirming what they proclaimed. Okay? And what they proclaimed was the word as they knew it. Now, remind you something. They didn't have the New Testament. They were living it. Well, what word did they have? Well, they had the Old Testament. Because if you remember, we've talked about this before. Uh, Paul, whenever he would go into these cities, if you go to the book of Acts, Paul took three missionary journeys, also had a voyage to Rome. Every city he went to, Paul would go into the Jewish synagogue first, and usually was run off and turn to the Gentiles. But what Paul would do was, was he would take the Old Testament, the scriptures that spoke of Jesus, and then take the life of Jesus and fit it together like blood. Pointing that Jesus was the Messiah that was spoken of in the Old Testament. Now, well, that's kind of what the disciples had. They had a lot of the Old Testament they knew by tradition. And then what Jesus proclaimed to them for the three and a half years he had them. But also, listen to me, they walked to him. They talked to him. They heard him speak. They heard him preach. They'd seen the miracles. They'd seen all this stuff. They'd seen the death, the burial, the resurrection, the, the ascension into heaven. They had all that. So they were preaching what they knew. Which goes back to what I was talking about a minute ago. You can't proclaim that which you don't believe or not. But look what happens. They preach the word. Which signs follow. Amen. Or in other words, verse number 20 is the most important verse in all the verses I read to you. Why? Because Jesus told them in the Great Commission, if you go, these signs will follow you. And then verse 20 says, guess what God did? He did exactly what he said he would do. As they went and they preached, God confirmed it with signs following their life. Listen to me what I'm going to tell you today. God will always confirm his word in your life. If you stand on it, you walk in it, you believe it, you proclaim it, God will fulfill his word. The Bible says, that as the rain comes from heaven, the snow comes from heaven, so God words that go You know, Thomas said, every step through the seed from heaven, there's a pathway, then one drop, one tittle, one darling dry, one cross the seed, but if my word to pass away, I'll watch over my word to perform this to me. God will watch over this to perform it. It says it too many times in scripture. Okay? So Jesus gave them the commission. And then as they went, God said, I'm going to do what I told you I would do. And listen to me. He will do the same thing for us. It will just go and do what he told us to do. Okay? All right. So look back. Verse number 15. Uh, walk very closely um, to scripture tonight. Just looking kind of as an introduction. Uh, setting you up to looking at uh, the commission itself. Uh, beginning next Wednesday. Look at verse 15 with me. And he, Jesus, of course, said to them, Go ye. Go ye in the Greek is actually one word. The word ye is omitted in a lot of your translations. But it's one word in the Greek. But before you can get to the go, you've got to find out who the he is. Because there's a lot of people that read this great commission, they say, well, that was just for the apostles. That was just for the disciples. I, I'm not, I wasn't there on that mountain in Galilee in that day, so it doesn't fit me. It was just for them. This is just a record of what Jesus told them. Well, listen to me. There's a lot that Jesus told them that's not in this Bible. But listen to me. Everything that's wrote in this word was not just for them, but it was for them through them to us. Yeah. 
And the Great Commission did not end with the disciples. Why? Because if it ended with them, that means after every one of them died, the work of God would have stopped. But not only was it given to them, but it was given to them to hand down to everyone below them. Yeah. And I always tell you that that was in the details. It's in the details of the Greek word that's used here. But the ye, you have to realize, is you. Not just the preacher. Not just the teacher. Not just the deacons. Not just the uh, whatever you want to throw in. I know it's for each and every single one of us. Because here's the word that's used. The Greek word, word, Greek word here that's used literally means to transfer. What it literally means to transfer. So Jesus here tells his disciples, I'm transferring this to you. I began the journey with you. We were walking together. I'm ascending. I'm transferring it to you. You now go for me. That's what that word literally means, to transfer. Okay? And listen to me. If you believe that the transfer was only to the disciples, then once they all died, then it no longer transferred to anybody else. Okay? Then it would have ended. But listen to me. The work of God can't end until God says it's over. And when Jesus looked at his disciples and said, now I'm transferring it to you. The role of his disciples, if you go over to this same uh, past scripture uh, over in Matthew 28, Jesus told, told his disciples in Matthew 28 to go and make disciples. Mm -hmm. Now, oh cliche, but you can't make disciples unless you're a disciple first. Mm -hmm. Actually, we don't know what the word disciple means. A disciple is not just someone who is following Jesus. I thought you'd be silent on that. Okay. Because the word disciple actually means to be a pupil or a student of someone. Because you can be following Jesus but not studying after someone. You can be watching from afar but not trying to practice what he's told you to do. See, a true disciple... Because Jesus told his disciples that I'm now telling you to go make other disciples. I'm transferring this to you, and as you make other disciples, it'll transfer to them. And then as they make other disciples, it'll transfer to them. You see how this thing is supposed to spread? And that's why if you look in the book of Acts, whenever uh, the disciples in the beginning of the book of Acts were just happy to be right there in Jerusalem. God had to bring persecution to get them to scatter because they were just going to sit right there around that one little old Jerusalem and preach just right there, there around that, that one little community that Jesus had led them to. There in Jerusalem, uh, Judea, and Samaria, and Galilee. That was it. That's far they were going to go to. But see, the plan of God was beyond that. And that's how it spread from generation to generation to generation, uh, from, uh, from, from families to, uh, to the ancestors before them and after them. Why? Because it's transferable. There's a great past scripture I was reading this week in anticipation for Mother's Day on Sunday. Whenever that uh, Paul reminded Timothy that the great faith that you now have, I saw first in your grandmother. Right. And it wasn't just in your grandmother, it was also in your mother. And he said, Timothy, I'm persuaded it's in you also. He said it's transferable. You saw it in your grandmother, you saw it in your mother, and it's taught you, you've got it. That's the same thing Jesus is telling his disciples here. I'm going away, I'm transferring this now to you. And therefore, everybody that we disciple, we transfer it to them. So Jesus here says, go, take this journey, okay? I'm transferring the journey because, listen to me, the words go here is a great indication of the transfer wasn't stationary. The Greek word literally is an action word, okay, which means I'm not transferring it to you to sit there with me. Right. I'm transferring it to you to keep this thing rolling, okay? 
uh, you, you find in the scripture where Jesus is always trying to minister and always trying to do and always trying to help uh, and always trying to uh, find ways and avenues to help people and to, uh, to preach the word or whatever it was. Listen to me. That's the same way we are being. We are this transfers to us and we keep the shit moving. Yeah. All right? So he said, go ye therefore, or go ye into all the world. You tra I'm transferring to you so you keep it going. But listen to me. I want you to go to all the world. I didn't told you the world, the disciples missed that when we were here. But here's how I want to break it down to you. You and I hear that, and the first thing we think about is what? Missionaries. Well, we gotta send them in for it. Hey, I agree with you 100 We should send, we should support, pray for people that are doing the work of God abroad. Because this gospel of Jesus Christ needs to be heard to everybody, not just those in America. Right. Yes. It needs to be heard to every person in every continent that ever can live on the face of this people planet. They need to have the opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they cannot hear it unless someone goes to preach it to them. So, yes, I'm telling you, we need to pray for and support missionaries every chance we get and every opportunity we can. But listen to me. Sometimes we get mixed up in the world and thinking that's for someone else to do. But the Greek word here that's used is the word cosmos. And the word literally means the system in which God created. The world system. Go ye into the world system. Now, let me know that the world system also is operation here. So therefore, what he's telling us to do is, I want you to take this, this, this transference to you, and you're going to take it everywhere that I have systematically created this world to be. Literally what it transfers to me. But, you remember whenever, uh, in Acts chapter number 1, uh, whenever the Bible, uh, Jesus told his disciples for he descended, he said, uh, when the Holy Ghost comes to you, you should be witnesses to me first in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, and then to the most parts of the world. So he gave them the plan of action. See, so you and I sometimes get so caught up in attacking it to the world that we forget my neighbor needs it. That we forget my coworker needs it. That we forget my family needs it. We forget the person in the grocery store needs it. We forget the person who's been treating me bad for weeks and trying to get on my nerves. They need it too. That's what he's telling us to do. You take this into your world, the system in which you live in, is what he's telling them to do. Wherever you find yourself is where you need to take this gospel. So tomorrow, wherever you find yourself at, that God puts you there for a reason. And that's to share him and the world you come in contact with. Here's what I like to put this word. It's the world as you know it. Because the world as you know is different than the world that I know, which means that you won't go to the same place as I go tomorrow, and I won't go to the same place as you go tomorrow. Although if any of you want to take my place in dark tomorrow, you can feel free at it. <laughs> So therefore, since, you know, uh, I'll go where you won't go, you'll go where I won't go, so therefore where I go tomorrow, I'm supposed to take this with me to there. Which brings up a whole other point. You don't take time off. Is there ever a moment you're not living in this world? Do you ever check out? I know sometimes we do mentally, but uh, <laughs> physically you really don't ever check out, do you? So every moment you're living in the world system as God created it, you're supposed to be God's agent taking his gospel. Which means tomorrow when you wake up on the wrong side of the bed and you're not having a good day, it's not a chance you take the day off. He did not say to only go on Sundays. Go ye into the world only on Sundays. That ain't what it said, was it? Or Wednesday nights. Or occasionally, if you feel like it, through the week. 
Everywhere you go, you're supposed to be going in his name. Go you into the world as you know it. So I want you to understand that, okay? I'm, I, am, I have been sent. This journey has been transferred to me. And I'm to take it wherever I go in this world every day, all right? So go ye into the world and do what? And to preach. But I'm not a preacher, you say. Good. They ain't what the word here means. Two different words. What I do behind here and what this word says are two, Greek, two different Greek words. Actually, the word here means to proclaim, not to, not to edify in preaching. Two different Greek, uh, Greek words are used. Actually, the Greek word here means to herald the truth. That's all it means. To proclaim the truth. The very strong definition of that word means to proclaim the truth. Well, do you think you can do that as a non-preacher? Yes. Sure you can. Because may I remind you of something? That, the truth, is the only thing that's going to set the world free. Amen. And if you don't herald it, they may never notice it. Or may never hear it. It may never affect them. Because this time, as much as I want all of them to be here on Sunday, they're probably not going to be. I would love for this place to be packed out. I mean, nowhere to sit and nowhere to stand. But how many know the likelihood of that on Sunday morning is probably slim to none? So therefore, you're going to encounter more people through the week than you will in here on Sunday. Yeah. So therefore, if they're going to hear the truth, they have to see it proclaimed through you. That's right. So Jesus here said, I'm transferring this to you. And everywhere you go, you are to herald the truth. How do I herald the truth? You can do that through what you say, of course. That's the natural way to herald the truth. But you can also live the truth. You can proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ because, number one, you live it. You live it by the actions in which you portray, the demeanor in which you hold, the emotions in which you show. All can help to portray what Jesus has done in your heart. Amen. Thank you for waiting for that. Because that's a hard one sometimes, ain't it? I'll throw my hat in the ring. Sometimes I don't feel like it. Sometimes I'm not having a great day. Sometimes everything is going wrong and not getting any better. But that ain't what it's saying. I'm to herald or proclaim the truth. And if I'm living something different than what I'm trying to get them to see, whether I'm not showing it by what I say, whether I'm not showing it by the way I treat them, if I'm not showing it by the way I just conduct myself and the emotions and the deme demeanor in which I show, then I'm not showing them who Jesus is. Because a Christian is someone who's supposed to be what? Christ-like, right? Yeah. So let me ask you a question. How many people you believe, how many people believe that Jesus acted like you did today? Yeah. <laughs> this thing back through your day today. Do you find Jesus acting like you did? Yeah. Probably not. Now hey, listen, I, I'm gonna be real with you, man. Hey, he was perfect. And you ain't, you ain't never gonna be. You're a work in progress, okay? So I'm not telling you, I'm not telling you that to condemn you. All right? But you should strive with everything you have to become Christ-like. At all times, to be proclaiming and heralding the truth as you know it. And that truth is what Jesus done for you. Because here's what people say, I claim, I, I, hey, I, I'm not a priest, I don't know what to say. Good. You don't have to say anything. Just live what Jesus has given you in your heart. That's it. It's that simple. Just live like a new creature in Christ Jesus. And if you don't know what to share, just share your testimony. Just tell them I'm not who I once was because Jesus came into my heart and saved me from my sins, and now I'm going to make it to heaven. 
Just that simple proclamation of what Jesus has done in your heart can bring simple conviction to somebody's heart. You never know what seeds have been sown, therefore what seeds you are watering, and what it will take for God to bring the increase from. You never know. But just proclaiming the simple truth that you know. Sometimes you do have to use words if you can. But how you live, how you conduct yourself, the demeanor in which you show, okay? The emotions that you portray goes a long way when people see you. Because listen, I'm trying to move away from this real quick. But do you, do you ever realize that we're people of first impression? Yes. Have you ever gotten the wrong first impression of somebody? Yes. But how, how long does it take to erase that first impression? A long time. So if somebody meets you the first time and you, you look like you've been eating on lemon drops all day, then they're probably not going to think you're a joyous Christian going to heaven. That's right. And they're going to have to watch you for a long time to see the difference. Yep. But that's the way we're wired to be. Every time you meet somebody for the first person, I, had a, I was listening to a preacher the other day, actually, and he was an evangelist. We, he evangelizes. I think he does pastor stuff, but he evangelizes a lot. And he was saying that every time he goes to the church, he said that before I get to preach, he said, I'm just, he's a, he's a fundamental traditionalist. He said, I've been wired by my, my father and my grandfather who were preachers before him. He said that before I get to preach, he said, I've judged everything about the church church by this. From the way they conduct their singing to the style of music in which they sing to the way they took up their offering, to who took it up, to who prayed, who didn't pray, who was our percentage school, and who came in late. He said, I can't help it. Just the way I am. He said, I've had to train myself to not let that affect me when I get up to preach. He said, because for years I was trained to look at churches and church people by what I saw of them first. And I thought about what he said, and how many times do we do that? How many times do you immediately see somebody and you immediately have an assumption about them? Yep. And some people have scars and things in their life that's from a past lifestyle that doesn't dictate what they are now. And you may judge them quickly and miss who they are now because of what they used to be. And how many of you realize that I'm not what I used to be? None of you are? How many of you not what you used to be? I didn't get an autocar here just a minute or two. So I'm sure some of you have something in your past that, that's not who you are today, okay? But how many of you want everybody judging you from what you was but not what you are? Okay? So first impressions mean a lot. So the way you conduct yourself, because everywhere you go every day is a mission field. It's an opportunity for you to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not just by what you say, but what you do, how you live, how you operate, how you conduct yourself, and the demeanor in which you show yourself. Okay? All right, look what he said. Go into all the world and preach to proclaim, to herald the truth. The gospel to every creature, to every living soul. Is who needs to hear this gospel. I skipped over a very important point I shouldn't have. Preach the gospel. That's what we preach. That's what we herald. That's what we show through our life. Is the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. Now the word gospel simply means the good news. That's what the word gospel means. Right. And actually some of your translations it literally says, uh, instead of the word gospel, it says the good news. Because that's what the word means. But listen to me, what is the good news? What, what is the good news that I'm sharing? I'm sharing with them the, the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Right? That's the good news. The good news is you're a sinner and on your way to hell. But i got good news for you. Jesus left heaven and came and lived on the earth. He died in your place. He resurrected the third day. He ascended to the Father. He's come back to get you one day if you get your heart right with him. Amen. That's the good news right there. 
And that's what I'm talking about. That's what we proclaim. And I proclaim that through the life I live. Why? Because that simple gospel changed my heart one day. So when I live different than I used to be, I'm proclaiming what the gospel has done for me. So when somebody knows who you used to be and they see who you are today, they can look at you and say, wow, something's happened in his life. Well, guess what that was? I met a man called Jesus, and the gospel which he proclaimed set me free. Amen. That's the power of the gospel. True story. There was a man that um, I was pastoring, um, anyway, and, and I invited a man to come preach. I worked with this guy for years, worked with him. I knew him. I worked every day, side by side with him. This guy was a pastor for a, from a young age. When I knew him, he was in his 60s. He's dead and gone now. Uh, 60s and maybe early 70s. He had pastored, I told you the church, it's a big local church. You would, anyway, you would know the church definitely. He pastored that church for years. He had an issue in his life and his family, and he left the ministry. For years he left the ministry. Well, when I got to know him, because he actually worked for me, you know, he's in my department, but he, he, had, he had started going back to church, and for he'd been going to church for years, and he had given his heart back to the Lord, uh, surrendered it to him, he had begun to start to preach again, and I had invited him to come preach at my church. I'm standing on the outside of the church as he pulls up and gets out of the car. There's a guy standing on the porch of the church. As the guy walks up, the preacher, I shake his hand. He goes on in the church. One of the guys standing on the porch looks at me and he says, well, I guess if that guy's going to make it to heaven, none of us got anything to worry about. He was judging him based on what he knew from the past. Right? And did not know who he was now because he'd actually moved away and came back. And had been here for a few years, but anyway, he turned his life back over to the Lord. I didn't say a word to him. Not a word. Singing got done. I got up and I said, Well, it's good to have Brother So and so here with us tonight. I said, He's going to be preaching for you. And I said, I want to tell you. I said, I work every day with this guy. And he is, he is the person who he's proclaiming to be. I spend eight to nine hours a day with him. He loves Jesus with all his heart. And I said he loves the gospel. And he's going to preach you a good message tonight. And he came up to preach. He did. He preached a wonderful message. Outstanding. Preached on John 3, 16 to be exact. I actually got the outline of one of my things. He gave it to me. Because I enjoyed how he proclaimed, how he presented it so much. And uh, when he served though with the guy on the porch that made the comment came up to him and said, I am so sorry. He said, I didn't, he said, I had no clue that he had, you know, had, had come back to the Lord and was preaching again. He said, he said, I want, I want he said, will you forgive me? I said, I'm not going to, yes, I forgive you, but hey, hey, that's how easy it is. Yeah. Right? Okay? That's how easy it is to judge somebody. All right. But that's what the gospel does, okay? So, Preach the gospel to every creature. Every living soul needs to. Listen, this doesn't mean go preach to your dogs. Go preach to your cats. Go preach to the whatever. No, every living creature, every living soul, every human being you come in contact with needs to hear the gospel. And that can you look at verse 16 real quick and we'll try to close. He that believeth the gospel message. And is baptized shall be saved. Now stop though. That's a very important point. Because there's a lot of people who really get mixed up on this verse. They say, so you're telling me that after I get saved, I have to be baptized before I'm saved? No, that's not what this verse teaches us at all. Because listen to me. You have to judge Scripture in light of the Scripture. There's nothing in Scripture that teaches you nothing. The Bible even says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. 
There is nothing in scripture that teaches you you can't make it to heaven unless you're baptized in water. Nothing. We can point to the thief on the cross. Okay? Jesus told him, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Today. Jesus didn't say, well, buddy, it sounds pretty good, but I can't get off this thing and baptize you, so you're just, I'm sorry, you're just going to go where you're at. <laughs> ain't what he said. Okay? When you understand baptism, there's actually three in Scripture. Okay? There is, as you know, water baptism. And we've talked about this many times when we've done baptism. Water baptism is an outward sign of an inward work of grace. It's not necessary for salvation, but it's something God gives us after salvation to publicly show that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Right. It's a symbol of what God's done in my heart. It's all it is. Okay? It's not a prerequisite to make it to heaven. And then there is what's referred to here out of 1 Corinthians 12, becoming baptized into the body of Christ. Yes. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 and 12, but 12, he says that uh, after you become saved with grace of God, you get baptized, literally his own words, baptized into the body of Christ. Right. And you get baptized into that body, not as you will, but as the Spirit will. Right. Now, when the point he's trying to make in that past scripture is talking about uh, my calling or placing. So therefore, you think if Jesus is the head in heaven, we are the body on the earth, and when I get saved by the grace of God, I get baptized. The word baptized just means to be immersed or placed into. It's all it means. So if I get immersed or baptized into the body of Christ, and therefore as the body of Christ, I belong to him, and I now uh, proclaim my calling in his body, which means that you don't get to pick what your calling is. He places you in his body where he wants you to be, not where you want to be. Which means you may not be the outward part that everybody sees up here. You may be the inward part. But listen to me. The outside can't work without the inside. Right. Right. That is the only baptism that's requisite to salvation. Because the only way you get baptized into the body of Christ is to become saved by the grace of God to be put in that body. Yes. Right. You say, well, that's kind of far-fetched, why would that be out of order? Why would we not understand that until what Paul said, but then Jesus put that here? Well, you didn't take up the offer. I'm not the offer of this thing. There are some, but the Greek wording doesn't fit. That would say, well, what this entitles, and there are some translations that bear this out, what this entitles is, is that after you become a believer in Christ, you then should become baptized. Mm -hmm. Which I'm okay if you want to if you want to uh, believe in that direction, I'm okay with it. But I want you to understand that if in the Greek it's telling you, you that believeth and is baptized, then become saved, there's only one baptism that ensures you salvation. And that is when you believe in him, you get placed in his body. Mm -hmm. That's it, not water. Has nothing to do with water. And the third baptism is uh, uh, to be baptized with the Spirit of God. Okay? But that's not, you know, you know, here nor there. So, so he says here, he that believeth the gospel which you proclaim and is placed in the body of Christ, the Bible says, shall be saved. But he that believeth not that chooses not to believe the gospel shall be damned or condemned to death. Because the Bible even says, y'all know this already, for the wages of sin is death. Right. And Romans teaches us that there therefore is condemnation or judgment or death or whatever you want to put to it to those who do not believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's all that Jesus is saying here. Your job is to preach it. It's their job to believe it. And if they don't believe it, then it's not in your hands anymore. It's on theirs. But if they do believe it, then they'll get placed in the body of Christ, and then this same calling is transferred to them. 
And then after that in verse 7 17, it says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. Boy, how important that was. I want to end with this point really quickly. Are there any signs following your life? Is there anyone, anything in your life that somebody can point at and say, hmm, that's a believer in Jesus Christ? Because I didn't make this up, he did. These signs, or in other words, uh, he said, hey, guys, listen to me. When you go and proclaim the gospel, there's going to be a lot of people who say, oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but they don't have none of these signs. You should know a tree by what? By the fruit it bears. I know it's an apple tree because it's got bananas on it, right? <laughs> no, it's got apples on it. So therefore, I can look at it and say it's an apple tree. Well, I know you're a Christian. I don't judge them. I don't judge you. I don't have to. But when I see you, you can tell me you're a Christian, but if your life don't show it, then you probably don't got it. Right. And the world should see the signs in you. Yeah. So he's saying, someone who truly believed this gospel is going to be, this will be transferred to them, and this is how you're going to know they got it. There's going to be signs following their life. Is there anything in your life that points to Jesus Christ? Anything? Is there anything to show for your belief in him? Anything? Because remember I read to you the last verse in that in this whole chapter. As these disciples went forth proclaiming the word as Jesus told them to, there was sign following their life. They, it was accompanied by signs that Jesus told them they would have. So is there anything following your life? I'm not telling you it's just prerequisite to thee. You know, the Bible talks about uh, the fruit of the Spirit. Is there any fruit in your life? One of my favorite books that Paul wrote is actually a book to a uh, young evangelist by the name of Titus. He was actually a pastor, but... Uh, you know, it's uh, named Titus. The book of Titus is a book of works. Now, you and I know that you and I are not saved by works as we mentioned both. That's not what Paul's trying to make. But he, the word works is used more in the book of Titus than any other book in the Bible. And it's a small book. I think, what, three chapters? Two or three chapters? But Paul keeps making the point over and over what your works do. Your works actually does one of two things when we're tired. Number one, it either points people to Jesus or it pushes them away. Right. Read the book of Titus sometime. Do that this weekend. Try to read the book of Titus. It won't take you long. Probably do it in a day. Easy. Look how many times the word works is used. And follow what the word works tells you will happen. Which tells you that there should be something of a sign, work, or fruit following your life. Yes, These things will accompany those that truly believe in my name. Do you have any of them? If you don't, are you a real believer? If you are, you're not a disciple. Remember, there's a difference. There are some people that believe in Jesus, but they're really not disciples. Jesus had 12 disciples, but there was a lot of other people that were following him. Are you a disciple? Are you a student, a pupil of Jesus Christ? And you're carrying that with you where you go? If you are, then you should have things following your life that accompany that. And they're not meant just for you. God gives you signs and fruits and works to accompany your life to affect someone else. Right. Can I have you stand?
we'll actually go and we'll, we'll take each one of these signs that is mentioned here in <clears throat> Mark 16. We'll take them one by one. Give each one their own units in that list. Okay? Uh, very interesting study to look at because it's, hey, I, I didn't write this. He did. So if he wrote it, then we've got to believe it, right? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we approach your great throne of grace. Lord, I, I thank you for the opportunity tonight to preach your word. Lord, I hope that I, I've done your word justice. Lord, I, I pray that I have preached what exactly you have laid upon my heart to preach in such a way, Lord, that it has resonated upon the hearts and the minds of those who are here tonight. Lord, I believe that this message was designed just for these that are here. Lord, you hand-tailored it that way. And Lord, maybe this is the core that needs to hear the message that we are to go as the hands and feet of Christ and to proclaim the gospel. And Lord, that we should have signs and wonders following our life. The fruit should be proclaimed from us. Lord, that we can tend to disciple other people, that they too can become followers of you. Lord, I bless your name in this house. I thank you for all that you've done, all that you're going to do, Lord. And I praise your name. And Lord, I pray that you be with us as we leave this place tonight. Keep us safe throughout the man of this week. Bring us back Sunday at the appointed time. And help us to honor you in everything that we do, everything that we say, and everything we are. We pray this night. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Monday, Sunday. Sunday is Mother's Day, so remember that. Um, any other announcements? Anything you need to. All right, if not, God bless you too.